Good evening. I'm really, really pleased to welcome you to this evening's event on building solidarity with progressive struggles in Latin America. This is part of the ongoing Arise Online Festival of Left Ideas, supported by Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America and a range of Latin American solidarity groups. You can buy a ticket for the festival or donate, and we have a great international session with Jeremy Corbyn coming up in the next few weeks. We've had hundreds of thousands of social media views, thousands of registrations, and tens of thousands of people join our events. It's great to be part of something putting forward the socialist ideas are our movement that the world needs more than ever. My name's Gawain Little. I'm General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions and a member of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign Executive Committee. All around the world, we are going through a major crisis, including in terms of the deepening climate catastrophe, and in many parts of the world now, a major cost of living crisis. Those of us on the left and in the trade union movement need to put forward ways to transform our world and put people, health and the planet first. Part of this must be changing the way the world is ordered and standing up to those leaders globally who promote the policies of war and hate. And this also means standing with those movements, those governments and others in the world standing for a better way where public need comes before corporate greed. This must mean progressive international cooperation on the left. And that's why we're delighted to have this global platform this evening and be building links between the left here in Britain and the left in Latin America, which has made some vital gains in recent times and is an inspiration to all of us. We've seen election victories in Mexico, Bolivia, Honduras, Colombia and more. And we've seen Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela stand up against illegal US sanctions and blockades. This event today is a celebration of our mutual values of peace, internationalism and unity, and about that crucial work of building links of solidarity. Due to the amazing level of interest, as well as the Zoom webinar, we're actually streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page and across various different Facebook pages. So we've got many people joining us this evening for our session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Guillaume Long, former foreign minister of Ecuador. Guillaume, the floor is yours. You're very, very welcome. Well, thanks, Gawain, for, for this introduction. And I'd like to thank Arise and Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the region more generally. Um, and I'm going to be talking about why I think there's reasons for optimism, but also why I think there's some reasons for concern. So let's first focus on, op on the optimism. Um, I mean, clearly, after five really terrible years uh, in Latin America, I mean, depending exactly how you want to define those years, but broadly speaking, between 2015, 2016, and 2020, uh, 2021, um, Latin America was in a really bad spot, both socially, economically, and certainly politically, with a very aggressive return of uh, the right in uh, our region, I would say a very authoritarian return of the right, accompanied internationally by the Trump administration. And the Trump administration was very bold in Latin America. It was kind of um, different from the rest of Trump's foreign policy around the world. This, um, the start of some, you know, some academic work on this now, but it was largely ignored for a long time. But actually, in Latin America, Trump, contrary to his more isolationist policies in the rest of the world, I mean, Trump was very erratic, so it's difficult to define his policies anyway, his foreign policy anyway. But certainly, he's been defined as more isolationist in the rest of the world. But in Latin America, uh, basically for domestic political reasons, and to have to make this deal within the Republican Party. Trump handed over U.S. policy towards Latin America to, you know, erstwhile neocons and fundamentally to the Florida-based hard right, um, you know, revolving around people such as Marco Rubio and people like that. And in Latin America, the Trump policies were very, very hawkish, very right-wing, very imperialistic. And we saw the return, the official return of the Monroe Doctrine after John Kerry under Obama had actually 
officially announced an end to the Monroe Doctrine. As, as listen, listeners all know, the Monroe Doctrine was essentially uh, the Americas for the Americans, as in the Western Hemisphere for the United States, as in for its exclusive hegemony and control. And this had been, this was always kind of the case, but at least under the Obama administration, they had the elegance to say it wasn't the case anymore. Under Trump, it was actually you know, reasserted in a very aggressive way. And we saw a lot of policies under the Trump administration in Latin America in favor of right-wing coups and <clears throat> authoritarian governance and human rights violations so on, and doubling down on sanctions in Cuba and Venezuela and elsewhere. Um, and th these were really bad years in Latin America with very radical right-wing governments in Latin, Latin America, obviously Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duque in Colombia, and others elsewhere. I'm not going to name them all. So those were bad years. And then despite this onslaught against the left, despite what we've often discussed on the left as lawfare, so the juridical and political persecution of leftist leaders, of leftist militants, activists, actually of leftist parties also being banned or prevented from running in elections, despite being against the ropes, if you like, the left managed to fight back and to win elections democratically. And this is important. It was a democratic struggle, a struggle for the return of democracy in many contexts uh, and to return to power. So this is this is serious cause for optimism. Um, it means that the first pink tide, if you like, the first um, Latin American um, 15 years of leftist hegemony, if you like, in Latin America, uh, wasn't just a mirage. It wasn't just an exception. It wasn't just something that happened because of high commodity prices or because of the strength of Chavez's internationalism, but it was actually, it's actually something that's here to stay. And that's really good news. The return, the electoral return of the left um, means that this was, this was not an exception. This is now something which is here to stay. Progressive, progressives and the left are a constant feature of Latin American politics. They are the other half, if you like, if you want to, uh, if, you, if, if you see sort of neoliberalism on one side, conservative forces on the one side, and progressive and the left, very heterogeneous, undoubtedly, uh, a left, a very sort of broad spectrum on the progressive side, but, you know, nevertheless, a broad political family that is fighting neoliberalism, that is coming back to power, that uh, uh, is the largest political force, not always a majority, but often the largest political force in various uh, parliamentary settings, et cetera, et cetera. This is very good news with a particularly dramatic return of the left in Bolivia after a coup in 2019 and a de facto government for one year. The left returned in Bolivia in conditions which were very adverse and with a landslide victory. That was very important. The return of the left after years of pretty authoritarian government in Honduras and, you know, in the case of Honduras, like extrajudicial killings, real persecution of the left, probably the most adverse circumstances for any left wing uh, party in opposition in the Americas for that decade. And they made it. They came back to power under the leadership of Xiomara Castro. Uh, of course, the very sort of very important and geopolitical, ge geopolitically strategic return of the left in Brazil, which is fundamental and emboldens all of our struggles with Lula after having been in jail uh, and the terrible government of Bolsonaro being aligned to this kind of uh, far right revival on, in, on our planet. Uh, so Lula coming back, the return of Brazilian democracy uh, playing a, a huge role. Um, and of course, the return also of maybe a more centrist form of uh, progressive governance in Argentina which was very important. Sometimes we underplay the importance of the return of the left in Argentina. Uh, it was very important because Macri was the picture boy, was the poster boy of the return of neoliberalism. Is, he was accompanied by the largest loan in the history of the IMF. So through Macri, through the Argentine right, they really tried. They knew Bolsonaro was not the good poster boy, child of the return of the right, so they needed someone that would uh, play well with the liberals and with neoliberals. And I think Macri was the, 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 the yeah, the, the one they really, um, that would, was really going to lead the return of the right. 
uh, they gave him almost sixty billion dollars to try and uh, to try and you know put neoliberalism back on the agenda in Argentina, and for this to have sort of a gravitational pull on the rest of Latin America, and they failed. Macri was beaten in elections in Argentina, and uh, it's been a complex process in Argentina since. But you know the left or the center left had been governing there. First, this is the return of the left in Argentina, Bolivia, Honduras, Brazil. But the left also won elections for the first time uh, in Colombia, in a context where you know, um, you, one wouldn't imagine the left to win. Colombia is the uh, historic strategic ally of the United States. It's the deepest security relationship that the US has in the Western Hemisphere by far. It's not the biggest economic relationship, that's with Mexico, but the biggest security relationship uh, of the United States traditionally has been with Colombia, with deep sort of a deep nexus between the deep state of the U.S. and the deep deep Colombian state, and so the victory of Petro there, I think, was very symbolic, very important. Something which you know, I don't know whether I would live in my, um, it, it, yeah, whether I would experience this in, in my life. And I'm you know, being Ecuadorian and neighboring country with Colombia. I, I watched, I observed Colombia closely, and I, uh, I was really surprised and taken aback when uh, the left won in Colombia. And it's something which we have to cherish and we have to defend because now, of course, there are many attacks uh, on, uh, on the Petro government on Colombian democracy. Um, and of course, um, a few years prior to that, uh, the left won in Mexico, which was also the first time in my lifetime that the left is in power in Mexico, a very important country geopolitically. Uh, an important left-wing victory in Chile, which since has been embattled uh, and struggled, serious set, uh, suffered a serious setback, but nevertheless very symbolic. Chile being, of course, the place of that terrible 1973 coup, which cited, started the neoliberal cycle in the first place, and the sort of Chile being the birthplace of neoliberalism in the world, really, in many regards. So that was also very symbolic. And more, maybe more optimism and hope to come. We now have elections in my home country in, on, in August in Ecuador um, with a very right-wing government that has basically been facing a very serious political crisis and has been forced by the left to, you know, sort of against the ropes, having to dissolve parliament and to organize new elections for August 20. Um, so you know, elections in just over two months. Uh, yeah, in two months, two months tomorrow. And uh, with very, a very good chance for the left to win that election and for Ecuador to turn to the left. Uh, and so that would be yet another country. You know, in South America, there are only three sort of very conservative uh, governments left, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Ecuador. And Ecuador, well, in Ecuador, we've got elections in just, on, in just over two months. Uh, where there could be um, significant change. So that's also cause for optimism. And more generally, I would say geopolitically, Latin America, after having abandoned Latin American integration, um, after having, um, uh, after the right having sabotaged such crucially important organizations such as the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, or the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC, um, we are now seeing those governments uh, where the left has returned to power, rejoining UNASUR. This is uh, not, uh, you know, uh, observed or reported by the Western media, but the return of Brazil and Argentina last April in UNASUR means that there's a real revival of that, of that organization. There was a recent summit in Brasilia in May, which is very important um, for the revival of, of South American integration of UNASUR. And this is really important because in the long term, I really believe that Latin American countries by themselves can't really survive this kind of divide and rule efforts that come from the US or elsewhere, can't really transcend their role as exporters of raw materials. And only Latin American integration, Latin American unity can ensure the long term goal of Latin American sovereignty, of transforming economies away from raw materials, of sort of a more global, less national redistribution, if you like, a more global form of redistribution for the long run, a more global, uh, yeah, a more long-term um, um, a more, a more long drive for development, if you like, which depends on the unity of Latin American states. 
so that's on the positive front. Now, reasons for the concern, very briefly, uh, before I run out of time, um, domestic conditions are not good for the left in power right now, basically throughout Latin America. And that's a real concern. These governments that we've just said, we've just mentioned, um, return, these left-wing governments return to power, but often through very narrow victories, not in every context. In Chile, it was a bit of a, a broader sort of, a more the, the, the victory was more convincing, but in a number of countries, the, the presidential victories were very narrow uh, and uh, often without a congressional majority. So no real congressional majority in most Latin American countries where the left is in power, not in Brazil, not in Chile, not in Colombia, not really in Honduras anymore. The only country where there's still strong congressional majority where the left is in power is Mexico, but elsewhere things are much more complicated. And this means obviously that, you know, it's much more difficult to have your uh, progressive agenda and your programs and your public policies in favor of, uh, of, of people and poor, the poorer sectors of society. It's much more difficult to have those materialize and for those to benefit people and for that electoral base as well to sort of continue to believe in you. So that's a real challenge. Um, and of course, the other risk is the rise of sort of destabilization efforts, right? The risk of impeachment. Um, yeah, general political sabotage on behalf of conservative uh, forces. So that's a real concern um, and something which we as internationalists need, need to watch. There's a real threat in Colombia right now. Uh, there's a real threat in Honduras right now. We need to watch these things. The other big concern is a sort of strong division on the left. And leftist forces uh, are very divided again along different lines. Um, on, on the domestic front, there's some division. On the international front, there's some division between governments. Uh, so this is not the heyday of the pink tide where despite heterogeneity, and nobody can doubt that there was heterogeneity on the left in the first decade and a half of the 21st century, but despite this heterogeneity, there was broad unity on the international front. This is not the case anymore with some sort of new left governments uh, sort of trying to differentiate themselves from old left government. Um, and those kinds of things are creating a lot of uh, fragmentation and, uh, you know, a real problem in terms of uh, sort of, um, yeah, um, avoiding pushing back against uh, divide and rule policies coming particularly from the United States. Um, so um, this has meant, the division of the left, I would argue, has meant that the Biden administration has basically uh, managed to keep the policies of the Trump administration in place, right? Um, in fact, when there is pushback, when there is unity on behalf of Latin American leftist governments, you are seeing the Biden administration having to sort of change a few of its policies. When last year, you know, a number of governments uh, threatened to, and then eventually decided not to attend uh, the um, Summit of the Americas in the United States. Ultimately, the Summit of the Americas was a real fiasco for the Biden administration. And, uh, you know, Latin, several Latin American governments did not attend uh, because several Latin American governments had, been, had not been in, in, invited you know, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, seen as the bad left by the Biden administration was not invited. And we saw a number of governments, including Mexico, Honduras, Bolivia and others, you know, not actually boycotting the summit, which was sort of a real fiasco for the Biden administration. And other governments actually going, but being very critical of this approach on behalf of the Biden administration of leaving, uh, you know, whole countries out of the, of the summit, of the America's summit. Well, that's when the Biden administration actually softened some of its sanctions against um, Cuba in particular at the time. And then we saw a change of approach, uh, you know, a very shy and timid change of approach, but a change of approach nevertheless towards Venezuela. But the lifting of caps on remittances to Cuba and uh, lifting on uh, some bans on travel happened as a gesture of goodwill of the Biden administration a few days before the summit. So that's the proof that when we push back on these things, when the left is united, you do get results. And um, unfortunately, this has become more of an exception than the rule. Uh, we've seen major setbacks. There was a real opportunity to get rid of Luis Almagro, the nefarious 
Secretary General of the Organization of American States, but we didn't get left-wing progressive unity at the Organization of American States. Brazil didn't really uh, side with Mexico on that. And, you know, if that first and second largest economy in Latin America had been united on this front, then we would, you know, the Biden administration would probably sort of yielded and accepted to get rid of Rizal Magro. It was pretty close to doing it. And then ultimately it saw that the left didn't get its act together and it doubled down and supported Al Magro. Um, and the same thing, you know, on sanctions that remain draconian. Trump's, the bulk of Trump's sanctions remain on Cuba and Venezuela more targeted sanctions on Nicaragua, less economic ones, but nevertheless sanctions. And those could be um, gotten rid of, I think, if there was more unity uh, in the region. So um, a sort of mixed batch of uh, hope, optimism, um, and uh, some sort of realism there, which sort of makes us a little bit more pessimistic. Um, I think the lesson is, um, the Latin American left on the positive front is still, I would say, still today, uh, the vanguard of the left in the world. And I know this is a polemic thing to say, but I think that it's the only left with the real experience in government for a prolonged period of time, with growth, with anti-neoliberal policies that have proven to work, and with a real reduction of uh, inequality and poverty in the region. So I really think the Latin American left is still the sort of where it's all happening on the left in the world, uh, you know, obviously it's happening uh, elsewhere as well, but I think Latin American left really has a, a, a strong, strong base of support and a strong experience of and an understanding of politics that sometimes uh, you don't have elsewhere in the world. So that's uh, still something very important and that we need to cherish and defend. But uh, unfortunately, more and weaker on the domestic front and more and more division on the international front, which is something we need to address. We need to push these different Latin American governments and Latin American processes to be much more united because otherwise, uh, you know, divide and rule will prevail. And um, uh, yeah, and we, the Latin American left will be uh, weaker and our people will be uh, worse off for it. Sorry for having spoken too long and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Guillaume, for that really important overview of what's happening in the region in terms of the left in Latin America. I think really important, both the positives and the real opportunities that are there, but balance with some of the challenges that we face going forward. And I think particularly, I think important for us picking up on that point of the importance of left unity, uh, which applies at an international scale, but also when we're organizing and building solidarity here in Britain. So uh, really fantastic opening to the meeting for which I thank you. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Logan Williams from Arise Festival just to say a little bit about the festival um, and how you can get involved in supporting, building uh, uh, the work that the festival does. So Logan, you're really, really welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Gwen. And I'll try and keep it as short as possible because we have some more fantastic speakers coming up again, across Latin America and Latin American left, trying to tell us how we can, what lessons we can learn and how we can build our support. But as Gwen says, I'm here to talk about the Arise Festival. And I want to start by saying that what a fantastic month there has been. Those who've been following our talk so far, we've covered topics from the NHS to, you know, more different issues like Ireland and stuff like that, which, and we have even better talks coming up on peace and what appears to be quite an amazing talk with an, another global uh, panel there with a work called A World to Win with Jeremy Corbyn. But we can't do that without your support. We are a volunteer run organization. We're trying to build this left unit, as Gawain and Gawain have just said there. And we, are, we can't do that without you. So if you can, please donate as much as possible. Uh, on the links below in the chat just to try and make sure that we can continue to keep growing keep getting better and um, just a little foresight obviously just to say I, I am really looking forward to that a world to win with Jeremy Corbyn and global guests including the president of the party of the European left uh, a Peruvian democracy campaign which I think is incred incredibly prescient at the minute especially in this call and we also have a session on peace and the Paris Commune which I think both look really interesting and hopefully will 
add to our educational side of the festival as well as our building the solidarity side. So just a reminder again, please donate if you can and if you're able to, obviously we do appreciate we are in a cost of living crisis, but please you know, support us as much as possible. Keep retweeting, keep sharing. It, every little helps us out and it really helps us to grow and get better as we go back into maybe more in-person and even future online meetings. Thank you. Thanks very much, Logan. And you heard it there. Keep donating, keep supporting, keep engaging with the fantastic sessions that Arise has to offer. And we'll be going back to our wonderful speakers in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to remind people, if you've got questions, if it sparks something that you're particularly interested in, we'll be taking a round of questions to uh, all of our panelists at the end of this session. Please pop them in the Q&A uh, box that you'll find down at the bottom of your screen if you have a look there and also do check out the chat in there we're posting some links some information that will help you to engage with the various different solidarity movements that are represented here anyway i'm really really pleased now to introduce our next speaker on this evening's panel uh, natalia urban from brazil wire who's going to tell us a bit about the fantastic historic victory over the far right in brazil and some of the challenges that it faces going forward. So Natalia, you're really, really welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here. I think uh, before starting set to say about the great things Lula is doing in Brazil now, it's important uh, for people here to understand um, that Lula came into a country that was not just uh, uh, fragmented by political issues, but also for economical uh, issues as well. Uh, Lula overcame a um, coup attempt that even though many try to compare for obvious reasons with the 6th of January in the United States since our, ours in Brazil happened and the 8th of January, um, now evidence are showing that uh, the coup in Brazil was much more elaborated from uh, in, in comparison to what happened in the United States with a uh, part of the military force and also with uh, uh, some sort of like legal background saying that uh, uh, Brazil had some sort of like uh, uh, a way for Bolsonaro to continue into power without uh, raising the alarms of the world about like a possible dictatorship. And of course, uh, uh, we, we overcame that, we win that. Uh, Lula had an amazing response with just eight days of government already having to face his first big crisis. So now, now we are seeing Bolsonaro in, a dis, in, in his most disgraced form this week. Hopefully he will be trialed uh, and he will lose uh, his political rights, which means that he will be unelectable forever. We are hoping a lot for this outcome. Um, but now going into the good things in Brazil, uh, Lula uh, is doing a tremendous job. Uh, we always knew he was very capable in uh, thinking about his history within the Brazilian uh, uh, governments in the past. But now he's, he f I feel that he's doing such a uh, much more uh, 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 focused jobs and, and immediate problems and not just in still having time to try to put Brazil again in the position and a foreign uh, uh, elite position that we had before as a country that was a diplomatic trailblazer with uh, his uh, um, incessant uh, uh, attempts of trying to negotiate peace in, within Ukraine and Russia, uh, talking about uh, multipolarity, uh, strengthening BRICS that now is presided, uh, the Bank of BRICS is presided by Dilma Rousseff, which is great. Uh, Brazil uh, has again uh, that amazing position internationally speaking. But at the same time, um, even though I read recently uh, a piece by Nevada Media that was saying that Lula was too busy with foreign powers uh, and, and forgetting about um, environmental issues in Brazil, I came here to clarify some things that that's not true. Um, Lula announced uh, over uh, um, um, hundreds of measures that will prevail, that Brazil will stop deforestation of the Amazonian forest until 2013, 
uh, 30, uh, which of course it's amazing, but at the same time, uh, it's much more um, aggressive in comparison to what other countries are doing to stop uh, the, climate, the climate crisis. Um, we are seeing now a correct response within uh, issues that of course, with Bolsonaro in power, uh, became much more uh, aggravated regarding the genocide of indigenous people. Lula sent help, especially to the Yanomami people. Uh, they were promptly uh, attended after the government had uh, um, knowledge of everything that was happening. Uh, we had a great first uh, trimester with the deforestation of the Amazonian uh, having uh, reach a historical levels of 31%, which with Bolsonaro, they were over 60. And that was happening because Bolsonaro had been, was butchering uh, the mechanisms we had to watch, watch uh, uh, the Amazonian with satellites and everything. And now we have Lula uh, 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 empowering those sectors of the government again, over a hundred, uh, um, different uh, segments of the government are working uh, in partnership with the Minister of uh, Environment to not just save the Amazonian forest, but also reforesting the Amazonian forest and the other uh, um, uh, wild uh, uh, areas that we have in Brazil. So of course, environment is one of his key uh, uh, actions in the beginning. And the working class, of course, uh, Lula uh, stopped promptly with his first month in the government, one of his first actions was to stop privatization of our mail services, uh, stop privatization of Petrobras uh, or um, oil, uh, National Oil Company and other six uh, state companies that were in plans to be uh, privatized by Bolsonaro. That is not happening with Lula government. And um, Recently, we had a very good report saying that uh, Lula um, achieved a historical mark that Brazil had its biggest uh, uh, advance on the GDP in history with 1.9 on the first trimester of his government, which was something that never happened uh, with a president just recently elected. And we are very excited to, uh, to see all the programs that Lula has put in place with uh, uh, social housing. Uh, Lula reactivated uh, My House, My Life program and saying that now he's not gonna just uh, aim for uh, the poorest uh, populations, but also for the middle class as well. So he's gonna do, uh, the government will uh, be incentivizing the building of more popular houses that will be affordable to everybody. There's also talks of Lula, uh, uh, from Lula saying that he's planning on to uh, get uh, the powers to uh, reappropriate uh, um, buildings that are not being used and transform them in social housing because homelessness is of course uh, something uh, that is a big, a big problem in Brazil. We also are seeing uh, uh, new programs to uh, um, discuss the uh, uh, reform in our pension system and of course land reforms and with Lula um, saying that he wants to work jointly with uh, the landless um, movement to uh, make sure that Brazil will continue to be an agrarian superpower, but an agrarian superpower not made of plantations, but made of uh, small producers uh, selling good products with a fair price, especially for Brazilian people. So we are seeing a lot of like social programs being activated again uh, regarding um, housing, regarding uh, hunger, regarding education, regarding uh, mental health, regarding health in general. Uh, Bolsonaro, who was a very well-known uh, anti-vaxxer, he had uh, destroyed uh, Brazil's production of vaccine. This week, uh, Brazil uh, announced that uh, they are reactivating the productions of vaccines in the country which means that Brazil not only will be producing vaccines for Brazil, 
but also for the rest of the countries in South America as well as it used to be in the past. So we are very hopeful. Uh, things are looking uh, much better than they were in the past. And the greatest thing that uh, Minister Long was talking about, uh, about the ho hostile Congress is that he's been able to do a lot, even though we have a hostile Congress. And he's not doing concessions. He's not doing, uh, uh, um, there is a lot of pressure uh, regarding uh, uh, the powers, who will get what uh, within the government, Lula said today regarding the Minister of Health, that he's not changing the minister, that he wants to continue with someone who has uh, uh, his the same line of thought that he has, and he will continue to do the best for the Brazilian people. And uh, because we had to deal with um, the coup and the rise of the far right in Brazil and et cetera, uh, Lula now is doing something, uh, he's not uh, uh, taking more turns again regarding how the media portray him, portrays him. So uh, he's doing a weekly program, which is kind of like a, a radio slash uh, talking show where he talks about everything he's doing, his agenda, all the meetings that he's having which is very important because uh, it's much harder for the media to twist his words like that. And even though there are, we are seeing twists regarding what he's saying, but we are very uh, hopeful that uh, um, he's much smarter than the people who are trying to see him down. Uh, Brazil, uh, of course, uh, we are still mourning the deaths of uh, the, the victims of COVID. Uh, this is something that Lula's uh, government is also put as a priority to do an in a proper inquiry to uh, 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 punish the responsibles for uh, the deaths of the people. There was a lot of talk. There is a lot of talk regarding the um, uh, the excess of punishment that Lula gave to the people who invaded Congress and 8th of uh, January and lots of talks about like, oh, they were forced uh, to have vaccinations. They were putting like a terrible place that's also untrue and regarding the vaccination of those people this was something that even within Bolsonaro government uh, uh, everybody that is uh, um, conf in confined spaces like prisons and other uh, um, governmental places they are they have to have mandatory vaccination so it wasn't like coming from Lula this was something like that the government was doing. And I think the most important is, uh, uh, again, like what uh, 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 Minister Long said about like Lula uh, integrating Brazil and, and working towards the integration of the whole Latin America with the reactivation of UNASUR and talking about the importance of uh, uh, Latin America being together in a moment of like international crisis. And of course, the importance of us working for us and again, uh, moving forward with a more multipolar uh, view of uh, foreign politics. So I think uh, we only have like good things to wait uh, from Brazil. Uh, uh, the reports that are coming from there are really, really uplifting. And the people have hope, has hope, especially uh, uh, when the small things, and it's very emotional for us to see, you see really, really uh, impoverished people celebrating the fact that basic food is affordable again, that people are being able to uh, buy protein, that people are being able to uh, um, uh, uh, use uh, uh, um, to, to, to have like a, a proper full supermarket cart again, things that, it wasn't happened when Bolsonaro was in power. And of course, um, this is coming to uh, thanks to all the hard work that Lula has been doing because since uh, January 1st, that man hasn't stopped. He has been working nonstop, uh, not just to recover Brazil from all the destruction caused, not just by Bolsonaro, but Michel Temer, the coup, and um, everybody that wanted to see Brazil as a co uh, in a colonial position again. And Lula said, we will never be in that position again. I will make sure that this time we will be in our full potential, 
and Brazil will be a country that Brazilians will be again proud to say that they live and work towards. Um, so I think everybody here for the support, especially for the people who have been not uh, falling into the lies that Lula is this and Lula is that regarding the, 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 the conflict in Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, all we want is to work it. Uh, Brazil has a history of working towards peace and that's what Lula is doing again. So we are working together for peace and, and it's important to have someone that has so much political savviness uh, to solve those issues in a very, uh, with, his, with a clear mind and one goal in hand that is everybody will be thriving if we have peace. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natalia, for that really positive, uplifting report of progressive advance in Brazil. Uh, important not just for Brazil, but for the whole region and indeed the whole world because of that role that it can play in building peace. Um, it's fantastic to have so many of you joining us this evening. We've got people joining from Edinburgh, from Liverpool, from Newcastle, Southampton, Warrington, North London, Norway, Ireland, Loxheath, Chicago, Bridgewater, Chile, and many other places. Um, do put your questions in the chat. We're hoping to be able to take a round of questions to our panelists at the end. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next panelist, uh, Claudia Turbot Delo um, from Whitpalas across the world, who's going to be speaking about uh, Bolivia's progressive advance. So, Claudia, you are really, really welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hayaya, brothers and sisters, uh, as we balance across the world, it really is, uh, we, we're delighted to be part of this space, as we fully appreciate the importance of continuing to tell the world of the region's struggles uh, to assert our national sovereignty and our right to self-determination, as uh, my you know, predecessors were saying, um, and to defeat the continuous attempts to destroy democracy in Latin America. Understanding as well why this happens, and of course, celebrate and support and defend our uh, hard-fought uh, victories. Um, since what happened in Chile with the horrendous, uh, abominable Pinochet uh, regime, we in Bolivia have experienced many coups uh, it is believed that Bolivia has the highest number of coups and attempts uh, than any other country in Latin America. And, and the reason for this constant attack and attempt of this destabilization of our democracy is of course natural resources. Um, just to give a bit of context, um, Bolivia, like most countries in Latin America, is unmeasurably rich in natural resources, uh, such as gold, silver, gas, water, and just to give again a bit of context, uh, in Bolivia, we have Cerro Rico de Potosí, uh, which is near the Uyuni salt flats. And for centuries, uh, Cerro Rico Potosí was the richest source of silver in the history of humankind. It is said that 80% of, of the world's silver uh, came from the Cerro Rico Potosí, which you can read more on Open Veins of Latin America, by the way, for everyone that is curious about it. Um, so, but this, of course, meant that the Spanish empire came and then pretty much left nothing for the Bolivian people, they really dry. Um, at present, the plurinational state of Bolivia has 60% of the world's lithium, meaning that this is the largest reservoir in the world. So this at present is the key reason for Bolivia's socialist revolutionary government and its sovereign decision to nationalize our, nationalize our natural resources and distribute the wealth of it that it generates to the Bolivian people to be the main reason for the constant attack that we received and that we threatened by coups against our democratically elected governments. Um, so I thought I wanted to share that with you because it's really important to understand why is it that we're in the situation that we are in. Um, as you might know, and my, my comrades, and I might say huge admiration to them and huge respect because also they supported us through the coup uh, with denouncing what was happening. Um, in 2019, you might all remember, and it's been said today, that we experienced a, a bloody coup, uh, which was when elected, democratically elected, president and leader of Masi PCP, Movimiento al Socialismo, Evo Morales Aima, uh, was overthrown by a US-backed uh, coup led by Luis Fernando Camacho and Janine Añez. 
as you know, as she self-proclaimed and as a de facto president. I am delighted to report that both are currently facing our justice system because they were responsible for the killing of 38 indigenous people in Sacaba, Sencata, and Pedregal, and thousands, thousands of people that were injured and politically persecuted. So Bolivia's revolutionary and decolonizing process of change, which began in 2006 with leader Evo Morales Saima, uh, has been really hard fought by the Bolivian people. And it continues to be an inspiration to all. Uh, and of course, including our, our collective with Palas across the world and, and, and Bolivians and, and, and brothers and sisters across the world will continue to defend it wherever we are. Um, in the process of change, it's very important, and this was mentioned as well a little earlier, and we can't we can stress enough the importance of this, land reform, which in Bolivia gave, <laughs> The titles and, and the right to land to hundreds of thousands of farmers, uh, a great majority of them women. And, and this has meant that for the second year running now, Bolivia continues to be the country with the lowest food inflation in the region. So we have sovereignty of, of, of the food. Um, at present, presently, we're going into even more positive <laughs> news about Bolivia and our revolutionary socialist government. Um, President Luis Arce Catacora has continued to respond with economic success of the management of Bolivia's resources. We focus on the recovery of our economy because it was hugely and badly damaged by the coup regime uh, in 2019 and 2020. Um, in 2021, for example, uh, the growth of our economy exceeded 6% and in 2020, and 2022, it reached 3.5. This despite, it's very important to, 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 to mention this, despite the huge effort to sabotage the economy with a now very well-known failed general strike that happened in Santa Cruz de la Sierra by five right groups led again by uh, followers of Luis Fernando Camacho and this private sector, which I'll come in a bit and explain what's happening to them now. So Bolivia's nominal GDP has increased from almost $41 billion in 2021 to over $44 billion in 2022. This is the highest figure in the history of Bolivia. So clearly something is working. And of course, that's, you know, continues to be the reason for it to, to want to dismantle our democratically elected government, the government of the people. So at another opportunity, and as I was mentioning a little earlier, Another opportunity, I will bring further updates on what is unraveling in Bolivia, because as, as Natalia as Guillaume said, we continue to be at the center of attack. Of course, if it's working, you know, a capitalist, right-wing, fascist a government will not want our governments to, to, to succeed. So the attack is ongoing. Um, at the moment, what's happening uh, in Bolivia is that there seems to be a very clear collapse of that private sector uh, economic model in Santa Cruz, which is the one <laughs> that has been uh, one of the main uh, you know, uh, people that have funded the coup. But they are under serious investigation because things have transpired that there is immense corruption, deceit, and, and we are understanding, we, I, we kind of speak I can't speak more on the, on the topic, but I hope that in the next event, because I know that you're really committed to bring the agenda of Latin America you know, to the UK and around the world, I will bring updates on this because this very clearly we are finding out where that, ha that, that financing for the killings of indigenous people has come from. I'm gonna start ending my, my message today by saying that the success of the Bolivia socialist policies and its process of change involves an ever going fight of the Bolivian people against brutal capitalism, fascism, and attempts to return to neoliberal policies and led many to hang, which, which at the time led many to hunger, poverty, and undignified living. So your sol solidarity is still needed and will always will be. So thank you for this space. The plurinational state of Bolivia will never <laughs> go back again to colonialism or neoliberalism. We will defend the process of change in Bolivia and will invite you all, all to join our struggle uh, to defend our sovereignty 
and to celebrate our victories. Hayaya, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. And let me just say in that ongoing struggle of the Bolivian people against that brutal neoliberal capitalism and fascism, we absolutely stand with you in solidarity and that solidarity will continue. And I think this is the point of this evening, isn't it? That in fact, all of our struggles, all of our fights are linked together and it's only by standing together in solidarity that we can win. Um, on that note, I want to introduce our final speaker of this evening. Uh, do continue to put your questions in the chat. We hope to put some of them to the panelists. Uh, we probably won't fit all of them, but if you've got a burning question, pop it in there. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to invite our final speaker for this evening, uh, David McKnight from Unison Northwest region, who's going to be talking about the campaign against blockades and illegal sanctions, including on Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela. And having participated myself in solidarity delegations to Venezuela and to Cuba and seen both the brutal impact of those blockades, but also the ongoing struggle of the people against them and what they've managed to build in spite of the blockade. Again, I think this is another really important aspect of this evening's meeting. So David, you are really, really welcome. And the floor is yours. Thanks Chair and to uh, fellow speakers and, and the organizers. Um, uh, Will Amos has uh, mentioned some of the um, the, the sanctions in terms of some of the more negative aspects of the challenges um, across Latin America. So the blockades and sanctions, or what the UN terms uh, unilateral coercive measures issued without UN authority and, and therefore illegal, um, have been used by the US government to bring about regime change in, in Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba. Uh, and in the case of Cuba, they've been in place for over 60 years. But while the US plays little pays little regard to the human rights of many of its own citizens, it manifests intense interest in those countries that it regards as its enemies, such as Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba, amongst many others. So what I'll do is I'll look at the three countries in turn, starting with Nicaragua, followed by Venezuela, and then I'll go on to Cuba. And then finally, I'll look at what we can do in the trade union and wider labor movement to bring the blockade and sanctions to an end. So firstly, to Nicaragua. Um, this year marks five years since the US orchestrated and financed a coup against the democratically elected FSLN government. During the coup, ordinary people were subject to terror attacks for sympathizing with their government and for supporting the Sandinista revolution. Um, a recent UN Human Rights Council report on the coup calls for additional sanctions on Nicaragua, which ignores the UN Human Rights Council's own assessments of sanctions issued without its authority, which include that they uh, that their legality is highly questionable. Um, the existing sanctions themselves have had a hugely detrimental impact on Nicaragua economically and socially. So the dozens of individual targeted sanctions that Guilherme mentioned before, for example, those against government ministers have seriously disrupted government business. It means they can't sign contracts and develop social programs. It's meant a loss of World Bank loans, typically worth up to $100 million annually. There was almost no help from the US during the COVID pandemic, despite copious help going to other countries in the region. The US have attempted to block the biggest export sector in Nicaragua, which is gold. And the new sanctions that they're proposing um, may, may target that sector. sector. Um, the sanctions have reduced favorable sugar export quotas. They've also created serious problems with international financial transactions. So the threat of further, further sanctions will cause even more harm. So now we turn to Venezuela, which has also experienced US-sponsored coup attempts. Under Trump, the US created an extensive economic blockade against Venezuela, currently being maintained by Biden. Um, their um, since their introduction in 2015, the sanctions have already cost the Venezuelan economy at least $116 billion. And they are opposed by a majority of both pro and anti-government Venezuelans. And I alluded to before as well, although the current energy crisis is forcing the US to make tentative moves towards easing some oil sanctions, the blockade is still a major impediment to Venezuela's economic and financial trading. And the US's objective is still regime change, in pursuit of which it has regularly issued threats of military intervention and against the elected Venezuelan government. Uh, the British government is complicit in the US drive for regime change by continuing to support the blockade. Um, also, despite the ostensible um, independence of the British um, 
from the British government. The Bank of England is also complicit by withholding the Venezuelan government its deposit of 31 tonnes of gold, which is worth roughly $2 billion. The real serious impacts on the Venezuelan economy. Finally, then to Cuba. Successive US governments have carried out a campaign of destabilization and subversion against the Cuban revolution for more than six decades. And fundamental to this policy has been the blockade. The impact of the blockade on the lives of Cubans has been absolutely brutal. In 1997, the American Association for World Health reported that it dramatically harmed the health and nutrition of large numbers of ordinary Cuban citizens and caused a significant rise in suffering and even deaths in Cuba through crit critical shortages of even the most basic medicines and medical hardware. So Cuba estimates it has cost the economy more than 135 billion in the last six decades. And the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the cruelty and immor immorality of the sanctions with the UN. UN Special Rapporteur concluding that the blockade was obstructing humanitarian responses to help the country's healthcare system fight the COVID pandemic. Trump then launched a draconian, draconian policy of maximum pressure against Cuba and in less than four years introduced 243 new sanctions and punitive measures. These have largely continued under Biden and in the first 14 months of Biden's administration alone, the damages reached by the blockade reached over $6 billion. But even Biden's own party recognized the futility of the sanctions. And only last month, over 20 Democratic members of Congress wrote to Biden, urging him to lift sanctions on both Cuba and Venezuela. And the letter acknowledges the grave humanitarian toll on peoples of those countries and urges Biden to act swiftly to lift the failed and indiscriminate economic sanctions that were imposed by the prior administration. In a recent Northwest delegation, Unison Northwest delegation to Cuba, our Cuban trade union comrades repeatedly raised the impact of the inclusion of Cuba on the list of state sponsors of terrorism. For them, this reinforced the de deterrent and intimidating impact of the blockade, as well as the country's difficulties in engaging in international trade and financial operations. All this has resulted in the closing of contracts, loss of relations with banking entities that usually work with Cuba, indebtedness, delays in ascending and receiving of funds and goods, among other difficulties with incalculable costs and consequences for the Cuban people and economy. So Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba are targeted not because of the things they have done wrong, but precisely for the things they've done right. The only threat they pose is the threat of a good example. And it is abundantly clear that sanctions have severe humanitarian consequences, including for health and nutrition. They're nothing less than collective punishment and economic warfare. They are counterproductive, they simply do not work, and they should be condemned and opposed in the strongest possible terms. So what can we do? Our international solidarity must be to support their right to self-determination and national sovereignty. And across the labor movement, we must support the right of the Nicaraguan, Venezuelan and Cuban people to choose their own path without external interference and bring an end to the brutal blockades and sanctions. And this also means calling on the UK government to oppose the blockade, and all US extraterritorial threats against UK based companies, and in the cases of Nicaragua and Venezuela, to support dialogue. In relation to Venezuela, the campaign here to pressure the Bank of England to comply with the Venezuelan government's rightful request for its assets to be released and the gold returned is, is key. You can sign the statement, normalize relations with Venezuela. I'm sure some of the links will be provided in the, bot in the chat. On our recent delegation to Cuba, we asked what we could do as trade unions to demonstrate our solidarity. And we were universally met with pleas to campaign to have Cuba removed from the list of state sponsors of terrorism and for continued campaigning for, to end the blockade. You can join the CSC campaign to end the blockade, sign a petition calling on Biden to reverse tr Trump's sanctions, engage with Cuba and end the blockade. It's hugely important that individuals and trade union branches and regions uh, affiliate to the respective solidarity campaigns, NSCAG, VSC and CSC. But when we speak to Nicaraguans, Venezuelans and Cubans about the blockades and illegal sanctions, they always urge us to visit, send delegations, send aid to break the blockades. The least we can do is listen to our brothers and sisters and demonstrate our solidarity by doing all we can to end this inhumanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, uh, for just emphasising the importance there of our solidarity, not just in sharing the positive achievements of the progressive left in Latin America, but also in fighting against the brutal and inhumane 
blockades that have been applied to, to those countries that you mentioned. Um, thank you to all of our panellists today for fantastic, fantastic presentations. Now, I did say that we would like to put some of your questions to the panel. So what I'm going to do for the next 15 minutes, and it will be no more than 15 minutes, we'll be finishing at 7.45 at the very latest, is I'm going to put a series of questions from the Q&A box to the panel as a whole. Um, I'm just going to do that in one round, and I'm really sorry I haven't been able to include every question because we've had so many interesting questions here. But what I think is a representative sample of questions, I'm going to read them all out now, and then I'm going to ask each of our panel members to come back in reverse order. So it will be straight back to you again, Dave, uh, to comment on any of the questions which they wish to address and make any closing remarks that they wish to make. Um, so we've got 15 minutes for that. Um, un unfortunately, Claudia has had to leave us slightly early, so I'll be putting it to our three other panelists, to uh, Dave first, then Natalia, then to Guillaume. Um, so the questions that we've got from the chat are these, and I'll read each of them out so you can have a think. First of all, it was interesting to see the recent political turmoil in Ecuador and the corruption scandals around Lasso caused the right-wing president stepping down. Um, in an upcoming election, what chances do the left have to capitalise on the political crisis? Secondly, what do developments like the proposed expansion of BRICS and promotion of trade between countries in currencies other than the dollar mean for countries trying to break away from US and IMF interference? So economic questionnaire on what that shift means. Uh, thirdly, how important have the return of Lula in Brazil and Mexico's more independent orientation been for the ability of other countries in the region to pursue a progressive path. And finally, how can we help counter disinformation in relation to countries such as Brazil and Bolivia and highlight their respective achievements internationally and also challenge the regime of blockades and sanctions against progressive governments and progressive countries in Latin America? Obviously, don't feel the need for each one of you to try and answer every question there. But if between you as a panel, you want to pick the bits that are most relevant to your expertise, um, then that would be fantastic. So Dave, coming to you first to comment on those questions and make any final summing up remarks that you would like to make. Thanks, Gawain. I, I think, um, uh, Gawain, I'm probably best placed to answer the, the, the question on, on Ecuador. I, I think from um, in, in my capacity, I think um, in term, continuing to campaign um, as trade unionists, as activists within the labour movement around countering the, that disinformation, um, uh, the, the solidarity campaigns um, uh, provide lots and lots of information, fact sheets, um, uh, information to counter um, the, the, the media lies and dis disinformation. So I would urge people to get involved in the solidarity campaigns and to affiliate with the trade union branches, etc. I think the um, I think the return of Lula and, and AMLO um, do, do, does actually have uh, an, an impact on the other countries and does allow them some space, but also has been highlighted there are some um, some differences in, in, in approach. Um, but I think that the the BRICS, CELAC, things like that do provide forums for um, countries right across across Latin America to demonstrate unity. Uh, where there may be some differences in, in, in approach, there are forums that can be used in order to demonstrate unity in the face of um, imperialist attacks and particularly around the illegal sanctions and, and, and blockades. So I think it's around um, practical actions that can be taken uh, as individuals, as, uh, as trade unions. Um, there are lots of things that people can do and the campaigns do work, pressure does work. So um, I would encourage people to um, sign the petitions access the information um, and, and continue that kind of practical solidarity. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave, very much. And that practical solidarity that is so essential in taking these fights forward and linking our fights together uh, internationally. Uh, Natalia, uh, over to you next. 
Um, I think the, the question about the dollarization, um, it's very interesting because when Lula said in April during a meeting of BRICS in China about the importance of uh, the countries of BRICS creating an international currency, uh, um, uh, it's come across the fact that the United States uh, having control of dollar, they are using uh, their currency as a punitive measure for countries that they don't agree with their policies, uh, with their foreigner policies or their domestic policies or their ideology or the government in power. So the United States actually gave the means to the other countries to start thinking about creating the, the, that currency. Um, and it's important to notice that even though we don't have this still like an ongoing conversation will be a very long conversation about the creation of that so-called new currency. It's important to uh, highlight the fact that even though the dollar continues to be the most used currency uh, uh, following by euro, that the yen, the, uh, the, the Chinese currency uh, was the currency that has the biggest growth in the past years. Uh, they grow uh, the number of countries using yen for their international transactions grow 3.3% and from 2019 into 2021 which is amazing because again, we have to stop uh, to having to accept United States as the major player uh, and, and, and figuring out uh, the ways for multipolarity will be under uh, a new currency where no one will be subjected to what the United States wants or thinks about the other countries. So I think this will be uh, one of the first steps for we finally uh, achieve a new geopolitical order. So thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. And that struggle to achieve a new political order, a progressive political order uh, is one that we are all committed to. Uh, finally, uh, Guillaume, uh, if you would like to address uh, any of those questions and make any concluding remarks uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks. No, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address the question on Ecuador, but I have to say that I really agree with Natalia. I think ultimately, you know, it's very difficult to look at Global South struggles just from the opti optics of their respective domestic politics. Right? And ultimately, uh, we need, you know, the Global South to fight against the um, injustices of this world, the uh, unfair uh, financial ar uh, architecture, international architecture that uh, uh, developing countries are a victim of. And yeah, there is some pushback. There's still some pushback from Latin America and, you know, and more and more uh, in coordination after the pandemic and in the context of what's going on now with the current debt crisis and the food and energy crisis in coordination with other states in the global south, including in Africa and Asia. And I think that's also, I didn't include that in my factors for optimism, but I see there is a more emboldened global south and actually across the ideological spectrum, not just on the left. And that's kind of positive because there's no way that uh, we're going to overcome all the problems that we face in Latin America and elsewhere um, in a divided manner. We need to challenge the structures of international governance. And those are monetary, of course, um, the issue of the sanctions and so on and so forth, so forth but they also uh, have to do with the whole system of governance that we that we face as Latin Americans and as, as peoples from around the, the world and from around the global south. Briefly on Ecuador, I think Ecuador is an archetypal case of uh, political judicial persecution. Uh, we've just, uh, Natalia was also talking about uh, Brazil and uh, uh, Lula being in jail in order for him not to be able to run. He would otherwise have been president. We wouldn't have had Bolsonaro, neither in Brazil nor for the rest of the world. This was a huge global tragedy. Um, at, on a smaller scale, Ecuador is a smaller country, but something very similar happened with a former president, Correa, being charged on completely, you know, taken to court on completely bogus charges. The actual eight-year jail sentence he received is for psychic influence, and I quote, 
psychic influence on others to commit crimes, right? Uh, and, you know, there's not a lot of attention that's being uh, paid to Ecuador, in part because it's a small country, but the uh, ridiculous and sort of almost surreal nature of uh, the court cases against Correa really, uh, uh, really, uh, I think, a, a great illustration of what of the extent to which the, the oligarchs are ready to go in order to prevent uh, progressives from coming back to power with the accompaniment of the United States, you know, uh, unfortunately. Um, now, the good news is that, uh, that we have elections in, in August. Um, the new elite pact in power since 2017, that's the bad news, has done a terrible job at governing uh, with the return of poverty and inequality. But in the case of Ecuador, and this is particularly true of Ecuador, a real security crisis. So just to give you a statistic, which is amazing, it's, uh, I think, the fastest decline in the history of Latin America. When Correa leaves power in 2017, there are 5.8 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. That's one of the lowest rates of homicides in the Americas. Chile was on three. The Latin American average was quite high. It was on 16 homicides per 100,000. Ecuador, 5.8 when Correa leaves office. Today, December 2022 is the last fact we have, uh, 26 homicides per 100,000. So from 5.8, 26 homicides per 100,000 uh, inhabitants in seven years. This is a, a, an explosion of crime, an explosion of uh, cartel activity, drug trafficking act activity, and a sort of erosion of institution of the police, of the army. You know, this, you know cartels taking over and penetrating the security forces. Um, and this is, you know, this is a, a huge tragedy with massacres taking place in Ecuador. Um, and it's obviously uh, a tribute to the utter failure of elites to um, deal with the most essential aspect of governance, right? I mean, obviously, it has to do with the rising rates of poverty and inequality, but also just austerity, neoliberal austerity, splashing um, the budget of several ministries that had to do with justice penitentiary system with huge massacres in jails, all these things, you know, sort of neoliberalism, not just being bad for poverty and inequality, but actually for the basic security of the state. Anyway, long story short, Ecuadorians are fed up with the situation. This has led to a huge political crisis with a, a government being very, very unpopular, 9% approval ratings in most polls, and having to call for new elections this is something that exists in the Ecuadorian constitution, doesn't necessarily exist in other Latin American countries. A government can dissolve parliament and call for new elections, which is what this government has done. Current president isn't even going to run again because he doesn't stand a chance. Uh, and sort of elites have asked him to sort of step aside. Um, now, we now know there are going to be eight candidates in August um, and one significantly from Rafael Correa's political party. Uh, There's sort of a ticket, pres presidential, vice presidential ticket with a strong uh, chance of winning this election, this would be another Latin American um, country tipping to the left. But as you can imagine, uh, the media and already there's a huge campaign against the left uh, accompanied also uh, from the international front. So it's gonna be a hard one. Last election, 2021, uh, the left made it, uh, won the first round 33% to 19%, but lost in the run, 48 to 52. I think this time all polls suggest that, you know, it would, it could even win in the first round without the need for a runoff. And if it does go to a runoff, I think there are fairly good chances that that could win. So that's the sort of uh, summary of the situation in Ecuador. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that and so much to fight for there. Uh, thank you to all of our panel speakers today and to all of our participants, our audience members, for your fantastic, fantastic questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take more of them, but I did promise I'd finish uh, by 7.45, which is just one minute away. And in that final minute, just in, in terms of closing remarks, I just want to say we know that the left and progressive movements in Latin America have hard fight to head off them, uh, to build on what we've already heard are positive wins within the region. Our solidarity, your solidarity is really, really important in that fight, both in challenging the uh, regressive policies of our own government, of the US government against 
uh, these progressive governments in Latin America and progressive movements in Latin America, but also just in exposing the truth against the lies and misinformation that were fed so often in the media here. So really important work. Please do get involved with Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America with the various solidarity campaigns working on the issues that we've discussed today. Please do get involved in Arise Festival, attend more sessions, uh, donate if you're able to, to help support the festival. If you want to find out more about the work of the General Federation of Trade Unions, our education programme and our international work, please do check out our website and get involved. We must continue to work together to make sure there is no more business as usual, that we unite in solidarity here in Britain, in Latin America, across the world for progressive advance. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I look forward to seeing you at future meetings, at demonstrations, at rallies, and in the struggle going forward for solidarity. Thank you.